What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lawyer You Know podcast. And I'm really excited about today's episode because it's a trial that I wanted to cover, but it's been very difficult to get the information about what's actually going on. And we're talking about the Delphi case with Richard Allen in Indiana. And there are no cameras in the courtroom. The jury is sequestered and so much is happening behind closed doors. But some lawyers have actually taken the time to go to this case. And we have one of those and the one that I've been following the most, if I'm being honest, the one whose videos I'm watching, whose Twitter I'm following for the Delphi case. I trust the reporting coming from this lawyer and I'm excited to talk to her today um, and get all of our questions answered about what's going on in Delphi. And that is Andrea Burkhart. And I know that her YouTube channel is very close to 100,000 subscribers. I have no doubt that very soon it's going to be over 100,000, maybe even by the time you're listening to this podcast. If it's not, either way, go and give her a subscribe. Take a listen to her videos. Um, there's a lot of information packed in there. I listen to them on two times speed, so it flies by. Um, but Andrea, thank you so much for taking the time because I know your schedule is busier than most these days. Yeah, things are a little wild. Uh, the court is keeping us on a very, uh, very challenging schedule because we have the jury sequestered. We're going six days a week. Uh, our, our trial week includes half days on Saturdays. Uh, we start very early because there is very limited public seating. And so to be assured of getting a seat within the courthouse, uh, we, ha we have to be up bright and early and there in line. So our, our sleep is getting short and uh, it's, uh, it's been quite, uh, quite an experience. And how long do they expect the trial to last even going six days? They have it scheduled into, uh, I believe, the, the third week of November. I think uh, November 15th or, or 16th, somewhere okay. around there, is, is scheduled to be the last day. Okay. Um, and that's pretty wild, thinking that they're getting an extra half day every single week. But that, that's good to, to push it along. So many unusual things about the case. Um, just in case anybody's new to the Delphi case, why don't you give them a quick, you know, five minute brief overview? I know it's not going to be perfect because everybody knows every detail about this case, but generally speaking, how did we get here? What are the facts of the case? And it can even be kind of a summary of opening art or opening statement, which you just listened to recently. Sure. The big picture of this case, it involves the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. They were 13 and 14 years old at the time of their deaths. They were last seen on the Monon High Bridge Trail outside of the small town of Delphi, Indiana. Uh, this happened on uh, February 13th, uh, 2017. The girls didn't return from the trail where they were uh, expected to meet their ride. So a search was convened, uh, called off uh, later that evening, resumed the following morning, and uh, at about noon on Valentine's Day of 2017, uh, the girls' bodies were found. Uh, the case was captured enormous interest. This is a very small community. This was quite a, a traumatic thing to happen uh, in an area like this. And so a large number of people uh, were providing tips, uh, trying to assist in the investigation. The initial uh, investigation focused in on an individual that has been colloquially named Bridge Guy. And this is based on an image of a man who was taken from a video that was found on Liberty German's phone, showing them at the Monon High Bridge Trail, uh, and a man is approaching the girls behind uh, behind Abby. So the man's face. Uh, is, is briefly visible. Police have, have uh, done a lot of work to, to enhance this video and uh, uh, try, try to be able to identify uh, this bridge guy as the most likely suspect uh, in the abduction and, and murder of these girls. So uh, tips flooded in, uh, trying to find, identify bridge guy. Uh, several sketches were put out to the public as well from uh, just observations of different witnesses out on the trail that day. Uh, despite this, the investigation ultimately went cold. And so it was five years later in October of 2022 that the investigation then turned and focused on Richard Allen. What had happened is that Richard Allen, he is a Delphi resident. He was a uh, pharmacy tech uh, worker at CVS. 
And in, in the days following the murder, he had uh, responded to this request for assistance and went to police voluntarily and told them he had been out there on the trails that afternoon between about 1.30 and 3.30. This is the time frame that the police are most interested in because uh, the, the video on uh, Libby's phone was taken at 2.13 that afternoon. So uh, after that interview, that initial tip and that initial interview where he provided the information about uh, what, what, where he was, what he saw, uh, he simply fell off the radar. There, there was no follow-up, no apparent suspicion that, that landed on him at the time. And police uh, spent quite some time investigating a number of other potential <clears throat> suspects. Uh, police ultimately cleared those. The defense has sought in pretrial motions to try to raise these alternative suspects uh, in Richard Allen's defense, arguing that essentially they were improperly cleared by the investigation. Uh, that request was denied by the judge, so that information has been excluded from the case. Once the investigation focused back in on Richard Allen, things moved very quickly. The police uh, located his vehicle. They attempted to uh, compare it to video that was obtained from a surveillance, a surveillance camera in the location of the trailhead uh, and identified a vehicle that they believed to be Mr. Allen's. Uh, they spoke with him, did a, did a follow-up interview. Uh, nothing substantially changed about his account, except that his recollection five years later was that uh, he had been at the trails in more of the noon to, to one o'clock kind of time frame. One of the pieces of evidence that was recovered from a crime scene from the crime scene was uh, an unspent 40 caliber cartridge. Uh, this was, this basically means it had been, uh, there was markings on it to indicate it had been cycled through a handgun. It, so meaning it had been taken out of the magazine, loaded into the chamber, and then ejected from the chamber of the gun, but it wasn't fired through the, through the, through the barrel of the gun. Uh, this uh, cartridge was found uh, between the bodies of uh, Aberdeen, uh, Abby, Abby Williams and, and Libby German, about six inches from uh, Libby's, Libby's foot. So uh, police were interested in this bullet, whether it had a potential connection to the crime. And uh, based on Richard Allen's subsequent interview, they ultimately obtained a search warrant for his home and located a 40 caliber Sig Sauer pistol in his home. They submitted the pistol and this cartridge to the Idaho State Police Crime Lab. A firearms uh, analyst uh, claimed that her, an her analysis showed that this cartridge was a match to Richard Allen's gun. And so based on this, police then did a subsequent interview a uh, little more of an interrogation. Mr. Allen continued to maintain his innocence. He denied uh, knowing anything about the murders, having any contact with the girls, denied that it was his bullet at the scene. Uh, but nevertheless, at the conclusion of this interview, he was arrested and ultimately charged with these murders. Part of what caught the attention uh, of the public in this case is that uh, rather unusual for a pretrial detainee who hasn't been convicted of any crime at this point, and, and Mr. Allen has no, no criminal history that's, that's been brought out at any point, uh, he was not held in a local county jail. He was transported to a state prison facility to be held, and he was held in solitary confinement there for an extremely extended period of time, uh, like we're talking talking about a year and a half. So about four and a half months into this, uh, into this detention, uh, Mr. Allen began to show signs of deterioration. There are indications he was becoming actively psychotic. Uh, his behavior was becoming erratic and, uh, and strange. And at this point in time, he began to make comments that uh, it would be better if he just confessed to get it over with, uh, take the heat off of, off of his family, that type of thing. And ultimately, he then began uh, to make statements incriminating himself uh, in the murders of Abby and Libby. So those confessions are the prime, the main piece of evidence that we, we really haven't heard so far in the trial. They're expected to be a real key part of the state's case. 
uh, because it's going to center a lot around what are the details of what he provided and what is the context in which he provided it. Is this a situation where, as the state indicated in their, in their opening statement, that these are going to be details that nobody but the killer could have known? that were included in, in his confessions. Uh, the defense takes the position these were coerced under the circumstances to which he was subject. Uh, they, they point to the conditions both in solitary confinement as well as to treatment that he was receiving uh, by the guards and, and other inmates, uh, essentially arguing that this was a process that was designed to break him, that when he did not originally confess to these crimes, uh, he was put into this type of environment to try to to coerce him uh, into implicating himself. So that's the real 10,000 foot picture of uh, the, the, the key disputes uh, in this case and uh, the nature of the allegations against Mr. Allen and essentially where we're at so far with the evidence. Yeah, it's about as thorough of a breakdown as we can get as far as the summary goes. So everybody kind of is on the same page about what the case is about. And being there, I think, is a really important factor because there are no cameras in the courtroom and all mm -hmm. throughout the pretrial portion, there was some publicity, there were gag orders, there were sealed documents and sealed evidence. So whenever something like that happens, similar in the Brian Koberger case, you know, something I've been saying the whole time, which I, I think you agree with is there's a lot we don't know. And mm -hmm. when it comes to a trial like, like Richard Allen's, I think there's a lot we don't know, but now that you're there seeing it, um, what is, what is the vibe in the courtroom as far as how the prosecutors are, how the judge is, how the defense attorneys is. Seem like everybody's working together like a normal trial. Does it seem like people are at each other's throats? Because I know there were some serious issues where the judge potentially overstepped her uh, bounds in removing the defense attorneys or forcing them off. And the Supreme Court of the state had to step in and say, no, they can come back on, but they didn't boot the judge. Um, so that dynamic seems to be continuing throughout the pretrial phase. How's it been throughout the trial? So far in the trial, uh, it's it's been it's been pretty civil, uh, particularly when the jury is present. There's there's been no um, sniping or those kinds of things that can happen in in trial when when people you know personalities sure. can, can clash and people get irritated with each other and, and stuff like that. Uh, everybody has maintained a very good decorum uh, when the court when the uh, jury is present. When the jury isn't present, uh, sometimes we do get a little bit more a little bit more personality a little bit more indications that there, there still is that conflict there. Uh, for us perceiving it in the courtroom, uh, certainly there's lots of mixed opinions and perspectives about the evidence, what we're hearing, the strength of the case and so forth. Uh, there does seem to be a, a, a general consensus that it uh, appears fairly one-sided by the judge in, in her rulings. Uh, she does tend to give a, a massive amount of leeway to the state that is not available to the uh, to the defense. Um, and so it is one of those things that you, you just, you wonder if the jury is picking up on that, uh, but it is a little bit hard to say. Okay, so you're getting the feeling like, and, and we're probably also both on the same page that that's not incredibly unusual for a judge to be state leaning. Um, yes. But in this case, do you think it's more than that? It's a little bit more than the average case? I would say yes. I would okay. say this this is this is a fairly extreme example of of leaning in favor of the state. There's just been situations where uh, the state is is permitted to pursue certain avenues or use certain techniques or things like that that uh, the same uh, same accommodation is not being afforded to the defense. Uh, there does seem to be a little bit more of um, Obstruction is, a, you know, is a strong word to use sure. in this situation, so I kind of hesitate to use it. Um, but just the defense is having a much harder time uh, overcoming uh, objections that sometimes seem a little bit petty, uh, a little bit not not really on all fours mm -hmm. <laughs> with. Yeah. Uh, yeah just how, how trials are, are normally expected to go. So they're, they're being required to walk an extremely narrow line with the formalities of the trial process. Uh, and that is, that is showing in the process. Yeah, and I think that one of the issues with this case as well as some other cases that are in the news is they've tried to limit what gets out to the public, but stuff always gets out to the public. Um, and there was obviously some pretrial stuff where somebody took something from the defense attorneys and leaked it and you know, that spun into the defense's motion with the Odinism and all of that. And 
seems like the judge mostly blames the defense for that. But we were hearing stuff about, well, now Richard Allen confessed, and it seemed like an open and shut case at that point once the defendant confesses. And that's a big part of the evidence, obviously. And as you know, it can be very difficult to overcome in a, uh, a confession, even with a decent argument that it's a false confession or a forced confession or coerced confession, because most jurors would think um, somebody who didn't do it wouldn't say they did it, right? Mm -hmm. And there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of context around this, and it hasn't come out in the trial yet, I think you said earlier, but um, how do you think the court is dealing with public interest? Obviously, there's no cameras, but there's also been some yes. other stuff going on, right? Like she's trying to block oh, yes. the public's access to certain documents and evidence in the case that seems like it should be public. Tell me about that. Yeah, this has been a long-standing issue with this particular case is the lack of transparency. Uh, early on, around the same time that uh, they were litigating this issue of her removal of the defense attorneys, uh, there was also a litigation going on over uh, what appeared to be documents being withheld from the public record, uh, documents that were being sealed without uh, without following the, the process for, for sealing without meeting the standards for sealing, uh, quite a, quite a few pieces of information that, uh, that should have been public, uh, but were being manipulated in some way by some person, uh, to, to prevent them from, uh, from, from being available. So that was, uh, that was also coming out in the same time that all these issues were, were being litigated in the Supreme court. Uh, they were ultimately restored. Uh, judge goal attributed it to a, a mistake that the clerk had made. Uh, and so those, those documents were restored to public access, but at the same time, uh, it is quite evident that the judge is very hostile to the public interest in this case. Um, the circumstances of the trial uh, are challenging. <laughs> Being able to attend uh, under the rules that the court has, has put into place in, the, uh, in, in this matter it's got limited public seating and they are being quite stringent about um, breaks and uh, just making us leave the court, line up, get back in line uh, for the first several days, like the first week or so, um, we, 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 we didn't get lunch. I mean, you weren't, you couldn't leave your place in line, uh, to, to be able to, to go in and, and eat anything. We're not allowed uh, to bring any, any food or drink into the courtroom. Uh, so it, it was, it was getting, it was getting pretty tough. Um, that rule has subsequently relaxed. We're now allowed to bring them into the courthouse, just not into the courtroom. So during the break, we get to sit out in the hall in our line and, uh, and have something to eat. Uh, so these are, these are just small, like discouraging types of types of actions, uh, that, that, that do have the tendency to read to most of us that are standing there in the line that, um, that this, this is, this is intended to discourage us from, from wanting to show up and, and, and continue to report on this case. There has also been an issue with disparate treatment of, uh, credentialed media and the rest of us who are just, just members of the public. Uh, particularly with respect to access to the exhibits at trial. So as you know, you get a real mix of exhibits at trial these days. Sometimes they're paper, sometimes they're uh, digital. Uh, digital exhibits are being displayed on a, uh, on a screen in the courtroom. Where the screen is positioned, it's, a vi it's visible to about half of the audience. So there's now again, real competition for one side of, of the audience as opposed to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so about half of the audience isn't able to see the exhibits as they're being, uh, as they're being displayed. With paper exhibits, uh, we often don't see them in the audience at all because what they're doing is they are publishing them by providing separate copies to the jury. Uh, so the exhibit will be shown to the witness, identified, authenticated, all that. It will be admitted into evidence. They will then distribute copies to the jury. Uh, and at no point is it then displayed to the audience. So access to these paper exhibits uh, has been something that uh, people people in attendance have, have sought from day one. Uh, the media had filed a request uh, initially to inspect the exhibits at the end of the day. Uh, that motion had been denied. Uh, she subsequently revised it to provide that, uh, that the media would be able to uh, view the exhibits for 15 minutes at the end of each day. 
This created a, a question about whether this order is only applying to the media or whether it would include uh, everybody else uh, in attendance because under the rules here in Indiana and just general kind of First Amendment principles, there's no legal distinction between the media and the public. Uh, the media are not are not better or more special than us. They don't have greater rights than we do. The point uh, of the so media seemed... is just as a conduit to the public. That, that's the, the reason yes. the media has any rights or power in the first place is because of the public. Yes, exactly. And so uh, it would seem logically then that, you know, the, the right that she has given to be able to view these exhibits, she's given it to the public. Uh, so we should be able to exercise that as well. That has turned out not to be the case. Uh, the judge is excluding everybody except non-credentialed media uh, members of the media from being able to uh, enter the well at the end of the day to view the exhibits. Uh, so so this is this is a problem. I mean, this is uh, something that is that is deeply concerning to me. Um, so I have I filed a motion last week uh, in this court uh, requesting both access to be able to go in and view these exhibits on par with the members of the media. Uh, I've also requested access to the recordings of the trial that are made uh, under the court rules. They maintain an electronic record uh, of the court of the court proceedings uh, that is then filed and becomes part of the court record under the court access rules. Court records must be available for public inspection and copying and. And from my perspective, this is pretty much the only mechanism to be able to get that transparency on that case. Like you're saying, Peter, I've wanted to follow this case and, and report on it for a couple of years now. Uh, I've been I've been aware of it uh, really since day one. Uh, but because it has been so difficult to be able to access this information, it, it's hard to, to have anything reliable to be able to analyze or, or have opinions about. Uh, so the, the little drips and drabs of, of information that we've we've gotten uh, have have just been, you know, difficult to be able to get get a get a real big picture view it makes me very hesitant to to take any opinion or you know take a position uh, about about what's happening or the likelihood of outcomes or things like that because you you just don't know you don't have access to everything so the audios are really going to be the only way for the public to have that direct view into into what is happening in the courtroom uh, they seem under the law to me to be plainly public records uh, the judge has disagreed with me she denied my denied my motion she cited a, a civil rule uh, that handles the, the the recordings in the courtroom, uh, not the criminal rule that to me would seem to be applicable. Um, so that hostility to the public public interest in this case really does seem to be an ongoing issue here. It really seems un-American to me as you described that. Mm -hmm. Like that does not seem like our country, especially state court. Now federal court can be a little bit different and you know those rules are are a little different for different reasons. But when we're talking about a state criminal trial, all of that does not sound right to me. And yeah. when we think about how the defense was complaining about the conditions that Richard Allen is living in, and yet these are the conditions that not only our judge approved, but judge mandated with how she just treats members of the public, citizens of her state and our country, and that's how she treats them and makes them feel and doesn't want them to be around, basically, is, is a really horrible thing. And frankly, I don't even have to know a lot more about the judge. That tells me a lot, right? Because there are judges I've come across in my career, some of whom are very open and confident in what they do and the decisions that they make, even if I disagree or another lawyer disagrees or they get appealed or they lose on appeal. It doesn't even matter. Like they're very confident and competent judges. And that to me is, I respect that, right? I respect that confidence. The judges that don't want you to argue with them, that don't want you to be allowed to see certain things or be aware of certain things or be a part of certain things to me are the scariest judges. Because it's like, it's so hard to even prove abuse of discretion because it's so hard to even see what they're doing. And yeah. in my opinion, one of the public things that we've seen with this judge and get overturned by the Indiana Supreme Court is embarrassing. And I mean, that, that whole process to me was like, she's forgetting she's also just a lawyer like the rest of us. And yeah. it, it doesn't seem like she remembers, I don't know what her background is, but it doesn't seem like she remembers what it's like to have a client and to try to do things for a client and fight hard for a client even if it's a client that did something bad, right? Or believing your client is truly innocent and what a burden that is as a criminal defense attorney fighting that case and she just poo-poos it and somebody, I mean, I, I, I hate to think this could ever happen and I, I feel like we do things in our office to try to office to make sure it doesn't happen, encrypted files and you know everything in the cloud and locked file cabinets, but there are a lot of people in my office and there, there are 20 employees, some that are, you know, younger receptionist type employees that could get access potentially to a file and let it, it's not an impossibility that that would happen and to act like somebody's career should be over because that happened in a high profile case to me is just, 
I don't understand the logic behind it. So everything you've described and everything we've seen in this case would make me think as a lawyer, I would never want to be in front of her. I would never want her yeah. handling my case at a citizen. No. I would never want to be a client or a party or a defendant or a plaintiff or anything in front of this judge. And yeah. if that's the case and lawyers are just saying this stuff seems simple, what, what does the prosecution think? Like, what, what do they do in situations like this? Because when I had judges, when I was a prosecutor that were heavily prosecution leaning, I would be even more careful to not step on the criminal defendant's rights and to not reiterate some of the things that maybe I knew I could because the judge was going to give me that leeway. What's your feel about how the prosecution's handling it? Well, so I have a couple of thoughts about this. I mean, I think first off, the prosecution is part of the problem when it comes to the okay. lack of transparency. This all started at day one when they arrested uh, Mr. Allen and they kept the probable cause affidavit under seal. This was plainly improper. There's no provision for that in the rules at all. Uh, it was... Uh, it's it's the type of information that you just you routinely expect to be available if the if the if the if the police are going to arrest somebody and charge them with a crime they have to provide at least a summary of why they think this is the person that did it uh, and so that was kept under seal for essentially about a month until uh, it just made it through the process. As you know, it takes a while to get challenges into court. Uh, the media did challenge that that sealing order, uh, and it was ultimately released. But um, from from the very beginning, uh, that was that was the prosecutor's effort to uh, begin to keep some of this under under seal. And I think in many ways, it's really backfired because people are beginning to question why this is necessary. If the state has such a good case against Mr. Allen, and if the state is so confident in their ability to prove his guilt, if they're so confident in the methods that they used to be able to get the evidence that they're using to prosecute him, then why would they not want to shout this to the rooftops? Uh, that that well, has been, I think, a, a big own goal in this in this entire process. Well, once somebody's in prison and they look like Richard Allen started to look and you see pictures and you see mug shots and you hear his name as the person who did this in a community that really wants justice for these little girls and the, the ball starts rolling. People start mm -hmm. getting on board. We finally got him. Here's the judge. So, Joe, if there's anything weak in the probable cause affidavit, they, we don't have to hear about it. As everybody piles on, we got the guy, he must be guilty because the mm -hmm. cops say so and the prosecutors say so. It's so clear. That's the only explanation. It's the only explanation I can think of as to why we want to hide this stuff that you should also know is going to be public eventually. So yeah. if you know it's going to be public eventually, like you're saying, it can really backfire to delay it and then come out and people start seeing, wow, this feels pretty weak. This feels pretty weak. Then you get a confession. It's like, oh, okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. We got it. And that mm -hmm. that's, that's the point of prosecutors also supposed to be a check and balance in the system and supposed to be people seeking truth and justice and only doing what's right and saying no when something bad comes across your desk, even though you could win and make a name for yourself. Like they're supposed to be a part of the process that helps keep things in check. And so often it's not what happens. Yeah, and, and in this particular case, too, uh, part of what's really disturbing about, about how this has unfolded, the pretrial process, the treatment of this, this man who is legally innocent at, at this point in time, remains, remains so to this day, uh, is how it seems potentially like the whole point was never to get here, you know, that... In a very in a, in a in a world that wouldn't have to be very different than the world that we're in right now, uh, had Richard Allen been appointed, say public defenders who were not who were not so dedicated, such fighters, such defenders of their client as the ones that he has has gotten, uh, it would be very easy to imagine a, a scenario where he's appointed a lawyer who sees, well, there are these confessions. What do you expect me to do with them? I think you need to take the plea. And, uh, and then that would have, that would have foregone, that would have meant that a lot of this information that we're now hearing, it never would have had to come out into the public eye because we never would have had this trial process. Uh, none of this discovery uh, would have necessarily uh, become available to the public, certainly not on this type of platform where there's, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of attention being paid to it. Um, you know, maybe somebody, somebody years down the road is doing a bunch of public record requests and is able to get little drips and drabs and stuff, but nowhere near the picture that we're getting by virtue of, of having 
a trial. And so that, to me, is is a really disturbing part of this, is, is the way that it does seem strategic. It, it seems that uh, potentially one of the objectives here was to put Mr. Allen in a position where uh, he, he would be inclined to just to just give up and just enter a guilty plea, uh, take take whatever peanuts they, they would offer him, uh, and and move on and, and never bring any of this out into the light. And that happens all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that literally happens all the time to people exactly like Richard Allen. Mm -hmm. And instead, we would have heard DNA, ballistics, videos, and confession. Obviously, they have him locked and loaded. It's over. But in reality, of the stuff that has come out, right? So mm -hmm. ballistics is is pretty weak, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what's your take on the the spent or unspent bullet? Yeah. So my my personal take on it is that uh, is that this is very weak. Uh, it's always hard to know what a jury makes of this type of evidence mm -hmm. because uh, the the witness herself she was very impressive. She was a, she was an excellent witness. She has testified 112 times. Uh, so she she is very experienced and knows the ins and outs of of what's going to happen. A very smart, very agile. Um, the defense really struggled to land, you know, a lot of blows on her. But there is a basic fundamental problem with her analysis, and it goes like this. Uh, she had obtained this this unspent unspent cartridge and Mr. Allen's gun. So their normal process is that they will they will um, process, comparative ammunition, a, a separate sample of something that's similar to to their their subject, uh, and attempt to create they'll get the marks on it and then they will compare the markings on uh, both their test item and uh, the, the subject that they're trying to match. Uh, so when she did that in this case, when she cycled uh, ammunition through the firearm, she wasn't able to reproduce the marks that were evident uh, mm. on this on this particular cartridge that that was recovered at the scene. And so then what she did is she test fired uh, cartridges, um, which then produces it le leaves you with a shell casing, and she used those for her comparison. This is problematic on on a bunch of different uh, levels. Um, her premise is that, well, they're exactly the same thing. It's just that there's a little bit more pressure in the, in the firing process. And so that will cause the impression, uh, to, to be drawn out more. It will, um, it will, it will just, there'll be a deeper marking that then enables us to be able to make this analysis. Uh, but I, ha I have concerns about, I have concerns about this, this premise that they're the same thing. Um, as a general principle of, of just the way that guns work, when you fire a cartridge, the powder ignites and that causes the shell casing to expand, uh, perhaps on a small amount, but we're dealing with microscopic types of, of markings here. Uh, so small amounts can, can really matter quite significantly. So I'm not, I'm not sure that we can really say Say we have an apples to apples comparison here, but just on a kind of more fundamental level, the lack of ability to replicate the marks through the action that she, that the state claims Mr. Allen used to create this mark, that seems to be a, a real problem with this type of analysis. So even before we know the defense is going to have an expert to, to come in and, and talk about some of these issues, even before we get into some of the some of the basic problems with firearms analysis generally, the fact that it is a subjective determination, uh, the standard itself is one of a determination that there is sufficient agreement between the markings on both items. Uh, this is problematic. What is sufficient? Well, that's up to the examiner. And so that's generally not scientific. Scientific uh, findings need to be verifiable. They need to be uh, replicable. Uh, and so when it's just somebody's judgment, uh, that's that's a little bit more on the, on the squirrely uh, side of things. So these are issues that are going to be drawn out. They were they were touched upon in the cross examination already, um, but even without getting into these underlying um, you know challenges to to the the technique as a whole, uh, there still were just some questions about the actual process that was done in this case and whether this is something that we can put a lot of a lot of weight on. Yeah, so it, it actually from your description, I'm kind of reading between the lines. It, it sounds like it came out maybe a little better than you expected or thought it could have from the state's case, but still some points made by the defense. And you think mm -hmm. that'll be developed more on cross, hopefully. Yes. Yes. So that's my expectation. Yeah. So, so ballistics and, and I'll just mm -hmm. say ballistics, DNA videos, because I want to talk mm -hmm. about the DNA and the videos, but mm -hmm. those three, in my mm -hmm. estimation, 
If that's where the evidence ended, there's no way they win. So I really think the confession is going to be the key part to see how that gets developed in the context the defense is able to build. But DNA, okay, so we heard stuff come out during jury selection that one of the victims had a hair in her hand, and we've heard DNA kind of in the news, and we didn't know if that was going to be the DNA. Then we heard it didn't match Richard Allen. So what mm -hmm. DNA have they provided as far as the state proving this case? So far, there is no DNA, and yeah. uh, that is a point that the defense has elicited repeatedly that at the crime scene, uh, Richard Allen's DNA is nowhere to be found. Uh, they have recovered none uh, in his home, in his car, on his clothing. Uh, there is no victim DNA. They haven't been able to uh, find any kind of digital forensic evidence that would link Richard Allen to this crime. Apparently, tower data doesn't support uh, an inference that Mr. Allen was, was present. Uh, so from that technical standpoint, the case is exceptionally thin. What we know about this hair that was found, uh, it's, it was entangled in uh, uh, Abby's hand uh, at the time of her death. Uh, it was recovered. It's been, it has a root, so it has a, a good source of, of nuclear DNA for, for analysis. Uh, it has uh, been identified as female, uh, possibly a relative of Libby's, but that has not yet been determined. Uh, the defense has really been hammering on this point because this hair, uh, certainly they have known about it, had it in their possession, had this information for now seven years, going back to, uh, to the time of this crime. Uh, and yet it was, it was, it was never followed up upon. Uh, it would have taken simple confirmatory testing from some of uh, Libby's surviving relatives to, to evaluate, to make the determination uh, if that is the case, if it is indeed a, a relative of hers. Uh, and that was only done about two weeks ago. Hmm. So um, there have been a lot of, of investigative steps and decisions that have made that has uh, the defense has really focused on as um, calling into question uh, the conclusions that they've drawn here, they're certainly painting a picture of a tunnel vision investigation where rather than following the leads, following the evidence to its natural conclusion, it's been a process of finding a sub, uh, suspect and now looking for evidence to try to make that suspicion fit. Yeah, I, I want to talk about kind of what the defense's theories are in an opening, but I just wanted to finish on the state's case with the mm -hmm. videos. So, mm -hmm. you know, the sketches didn't come in, but the videos, mm -hmm. what have they proven? What connections have they made to Richard Allen? How has the state presented that to the jury? So uh, the, 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 the videos, the only video that is, um, that is like really definitive is the, is the bridge guy video. Uh, this mm -hmm. video that was recovered from Libby's phone, the police uh, did some enhancement on it. We've been able to see both of those videos. Uh, they are markedly different, uh, like to such an extent that it's hard to believe in, in some ways that they're the same thing. Uh, when we first watched the raw video that was recovered from Libby's phone, uh, this video is very jerky. It does appear that it was taken uh, surreptitiously, like that Libby was trying very hard for it not to be seen that she was taking this video. So the phone is is most of the time it's pointed at the ground. It's it's um, it's moving. It's it's showing it's showing branches. And there's only a brief moment where it turns up into the direction of the bridge, and uh, you're able to see Abby quite clearly on the bridge, uh, but you really don't get a good look at uh, at the the, the person that is behind her. You can, I couldn't even see a person behind her the, the first time that we watched this video. Uh, the enhanced video that they've done, they have purported to stabilize it so that all of the movement of the camera is, is taken away and they uh, can show it as if it's, uh, as if it's a continual um, uh, video in, in one orientation. And so in that video, uh, they get a, a couple of seconds of Abby walking and uh, you're able to see a man coming up behind her on the trail. This is the video that was then, uh, as I indicated, it was it was blown up. It was screenshot. The the image of Bridge Guy. It was released in the early days of the investigation. It's it's uh, it's everywhere. It's still out there. I think on the FBI's website. Um, so this, this video is an important piece of their evidence, who Bridge Guy is, because the, the context, the circumstances, uh, does seem to suggest that, yes, this is really the, the moment of the abduction uh, that, that, that Libby was able to catch on tape. The final moments of this video uh, are a male's voice saying, guys, down the hill. Um, so it, that, 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 seems to be, that, that seems to be pretty significant. Uh, it's not 
clear enough to really be able to get a definitive a definitive um, view, you know, an identification uh, of, of any particular individual. Uh, there's not a lot of distinctive characteristics to this bridge guy. He's just a, you know, he's a man with a kind of beer belly, you know, stocky build, wearing pretty normal hunter-like clothing, blue jacket and, and jeans. Um, he's got a hood up. Don't really see a lot of his face. Uh, so... It's challenging uh, material, raw material, to be able to work with from an investigative standpoint. Now, despite that, there have been several witnesses who were out at the trail uh, on the day and in the general time frame in question. We've heard from some of those witnesses uh, because they have uh, purported to see individuals on the trail that then later on, uh, when they saw this, this photograph of Bridge Guy, they made the connection, the person that I saw is bridge guy. They, they had that, that, that recognition. The issue with this, uh, as you know, Peter, there, there's a lot of challenges with, with eyewitness identifications. Our, our memories are just not nearly as reliable as we would like to think they are. And so the physical descriptions that these witnesses have provided of the person that they saw, there's, there's problems with it both in corresponding to bridge guy and very much so in, in corresponding with Richard Allen. Some of these witnesses has, have described the man as a uh, tall, muscular, in his 20s or 30s, youthful. One of the uh, witnesses described him as uh, being beautiful uh, in his appearance. Uh, and Mr. Allen, the most distinctive characteristic about him is he is very short. Uh, he is, I would put him in the ballpark of, you know, 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five, five. Um, he, he is not by any stretch of the, the imagination a tall man. And so it's it's hard to reconcile that with the descriptions provided that the eyewitnesses describe somebody who was walking by who was much taller than them. Uh, these witnesses are like 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, um, and just the, the mere fact that you would think when, when you're describing somebody, if, if Mr. M Mr. Allen had been the thing that you saw, what's the thing that would stand out? Oh, it would be this short guy that I saw, you know, going, going down the trail. So that's, that's one piece of the video evidence. The other piece of video evidence that the state has is this surveillance video from this place called Hoosier Harvest Store. Um, it's been described as, as, an, art, as, an, uh, as an agricultural type of facility. They store grain, they store cattle silage, um, but they have, a, they have apparently a small store back there. Uh, so they have a surveillance camera that points out at the road and is able to capture some vehicles as they drive by. From that video, they have been able to identify uh, the vehicles of some of these witnesses who have put themselves out there and, and uh, say that they have seen things so that they can then uh, kind of create the timeline of uh, substantiating when these people were on the trail and when these uh, all of these events have occurred. As part of that video, they have identified a vehicle that uh, they believe is Mr. Allen's vehicle going by at uh, 127 uh, on the afternoon uh, in question. Uh, it is not a clear video. It does not pick up the driver. It does not pick up the license plate. So we're now we're kind of in the ballpark of, well, it has a similar shape and it seems to have similar wheels. Uh, Mr. Allen had two vehicles at the time. One was a, a 2016 black Ford Focus. Uh, we've seen photographs of that vehicle. Um, and that's the one that uh, police appear to be alleging, uh, you know, matches this, this video, uh, this video car. But again, it's just, it's very difficult to say definitively because the quality of that evidence uh, is, is not nearly as good as you would like it to be for identification purposes. Yeah, and again, so all of that seems like maybe if we have more, we can try to use it and you know mm -hmm. stack it on top of other things, but none of that sounds definitive, which is kind of what I expected to happen in the evidence without the confession. And, mm -hmm. and it seems like there's gonna be some eyewitnesses that are maybe bad for the state coming later. So mm -hmm. what has the defense in their cross, but also in opening statements, what have they kind of mm -hmm. told this jury to make the jury think like, okay, let's remember this as we're listening to this evidence, as we're watching this evidence, not just to take it lock and key and not just to, you know, guarantee Richard Allen's guilt, but let's wait mm -hmm. because the defense told us other stuff is coming. What is it mm -hmm. that they told the jury's coming? Well, they haven't gotten into a lot of details. They have really just um, foreshadowed certain things. They've dropped little hints, and a big hint that they have dropped is digital forensics. They have dropped big hints 
about digital forensics, um, not just in their opening statement where they have made a point of emphasizing uh, and distinguishing from the, the soft science of the firearms comparison and the, and the, uh, the, the video analysis and, and so forth, um, the digital evidence as being hard data, reliable data, accurate data. So there is something in there that uh, the, the, defense, uh, the, the defense is going to want to draw out. Uh, we've heard a little bit of that so far just coming through the state's case in chief. Um, the police originally just extracted uh, Libby's phone for the day of February the 13th. Uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, extract subsequent days. And so initially what they saw was that there was certain activity that was going on during the phone. Uh, they can get things like, um, like Apple health data, like we saw in the Karen Reed trial showing uh, steps and elevation changes and things like that. Uh, so according to the state, they're able to show that um, shortly after this video was taken, uh, the movement stopped about 2.32. Uh, the phone did not uh, detect any, any steps after that. The state is conflating that with the, the phone not detecting movement, uh, but that of course is inaccurate. That's a point that the defense is making repeatedly. The Apple phone measures steps. It doesn't measure, it doesn't measure movement. Uh, the phone stopped connecting to the cell network at about 4.45 uh, that afternoon. And so police were initially under the impression that the phone just died. Uh, it powered off, and so that's why there was, there was no further data. Well, in later years, when more of this phone was extracted and more analysis was done, they discovered that the phone reconnected the following day at about, uh, at about 4 in the morning. So... This is something that the state is, is having a, a hard time explaining. They don't have an explanation. They thought it was powered off. If it was powered back on, somebody needed to do that. And this seems to be well beyond the time frame uh, that they're putting Mr. Allen at the scene. Uh, the alternative that the, the defense is, is suggesting and has put out there is that um, the connection to the network is... Uh, reflecting uh, movement of Abby and Libby and the possibility that they were removed from the scene uh, in, into an area where uh, they would not have they would not have had the the cell the cell tower connection uh, and then uh, when they were brought back to the scene uh, that that would be the point when. Uh, when the phones reconnected. Uh, we haven't heard a lot of information yet about the tower network, which is gonna be a really critical part of, of this theory. We are in a rural area, and just like we've seen over there, over there in Coburger, uh, in rural areas, you don't have good overlapping dense cell coverage. You might have one tower that covers a, a very extensive area. Uh, so it's not really that unusual to, to find an area where cell coverage is, is very poor, very spotty, uh, or just generally unavailable. So we're, we're likely going to have to wait for the defense case for a lot more of those details. But those are those are some of the hints that they're dropping. I'd say that is the main one. Uh, is really is really the digital evidence. They did very specifically. Uh, Mr. Baldwin uh, gave the opening statement for Mr. Allen, uh, and he very specifically, emphatically implored the jury, wait for us, wait for the defense. You will be glad that you did. So me personally, I, I am on the edge of my seat. I'm on pins and needles. That's a commitment when an attorney in, in their opening mm -hmm. statement, uh, opening statement is often, I always see it as this is your promises to the jury. You're making, you're making commitments to them. If you don't lead up, you know, follow up on those commitments, uh, you're going to lose their trust. And uh, so you got to be very careful about what you commit to in your, in your opening statement. Uh, he was very clear about making that commitment. So I have expectations and I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out. Yeah. Without a burden. And you say something like that. Now you got to bring the goods when it's your time to go. Yep. Put up one of the things up. I always find is interesting around this case that kind of led up to the trial as well. And earlier I said, like, when you really believe your client is innocent, which I believe these attorneys do, but I think maybe one of the major reasons that these attorneys do is the third party defense, right? That somebody else did this, the Odinism theory that is not coming into this trial. So how much do you think that has affected the defense? Um, now that you're kind of hearing what the evidence is from the state, do you agree or disagree with the judge's decision to not allow that type of argument in this trial? And how do you think it would have affected it? 
Well, I've, I've strongly disagreed with this decision uh, from, from the point that it was made. Uh, from my perspective, I, I think this is very likely one of the strongest appellate issues that they will have to work with in the event that, that Mr. Allen is convicted uh, and, that, and that process moves forward. Uh, there did seem to be very good indications, including some... Uh, some evidence that seems to be at least as strong as what the, the state is presenting against Mr. Allen in the sense of people implicating themselves uh, in, in, in the commission of this crime, uh, circumstances that are peculiar. Uh, so the focus of, of the Odinism defense, uh, really it, or, it originates from the condition of, of the girls as they were found at the crime scene. Um, so one of the girls was found nude. One of the girls was found uh, clothed. Both of them were in postures that the defense uh, is is alleging were were posed. These are specific postures. Uh, they were not they were not killed where they lie. Um, that that is clear from the evidence. Even the state is conceding. It appears that Libby was um, was killed by uh, by a tree that was some distance, if only maybe six, 10 feet or something like that, but still some distance from uh, where she was ultimately discovered, where she, uh, she came to rest. The peculiar aspect of this crime scene has to do with these tree branches that were placed uh, across the bodies of the victims. Um, the state is conceding that these were placed deliberately by human hands. This isn't a situation where um, just, you know, things fell out of the trees from wind or, or something like that. Uh, the defense is alleging that these branches were placed in, in particular patterns that uh, resemble runes, that resemble Nordic runes that would be uh, associated uh, with these, these Odinist um, cult type of type of practices. Uh, the state is alleging that these were mere efforts at, uh, at concealment or camouflage uh, of the bodies. Uh, this, I, I, the state's position is hard for me to reconcile now, having, having seen the crime scene, having seen, seen the photos and, and how this looked because, um, there, there's just not, there's nothing concealing about it. Um, the it's girls almost like are they wanted somebody on, to see it like that. What's that? It's almost like they wanted somebody to see it like that. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 if, if they were going to, if they were trying to conceal the girls, there were much better ways to do it. There's a creek right there that, that they, that they could have been put in. Uh, there's, they're lying on, this is a, this is an old, it looks like a fairly old growth deciduous forest. There is a lot of leaf mulch on the floor, on, on the forest floor in February. They could have simply scooped up the leaves, you know, mm -hmm. piled them on the girls. There, there just were other ways to, to, to conceal them if, if that was the objective here. And not much of the girls are covered. Like some of the, the twigs on Abby in particular, the, these are small twigs. These are not, you know, big, big branches that, that would cover a lot. Mm. Um, so that, that's, it's a difficult theory for, for me to, uh, to, to really get on board with this, the, the concealment theory of the states. Uh, that said, the Odinist theory, I mean, it, it is wild. When it came out in these pretrial motions, um, that is not a motion that you read every day. Uh, the part of the world I live in, I'm from southeastern Washington. Um, we white nationalist organizations are not unknown to my area. Um, Sandpoint, Idaho, has kind of been one of the one of the hotbeds of this type of activity for for quite quite a number of years. Um, but this was not a flavor that I had heard of before. I had never heard of of Odinism, uh, but it is apparently substantiated. There are um, there are professors, people in the FBI who study these these types of organizations, uh, and so. It did seem that the defense was going to be able to, to bring some meat um, to, to show that, yes, this is a real thing and that these practices are consistent with that. And then we've been able to identify people in this area, some of whom have connections uh, to, to these girls uh, who, who are members of, of these types of organizations. So... It is a, it is a, it is a, it's a wild theory. It's one of those things that, wow, it's really, it's hard to believe. It's hard to think that, that something like that would happen. Uh, but it does, it does seem to have some meat to it. So I do think it is a, a big challenge for the defense to not be able to go down that road. Having said that, I, I did get just yesterday in court that the slightest impression that perhaps that door may be cracking open slightly, uh, because those, those initial motions, 
in, in Indiana, in most cases, motions in limine, they are preliminary. Uh, you can revisit them at trial. Mm -hmm. uh, Indiana is one of the states that provides that um, a motion in limine essentially is just saying uh, until you get permission of the court, you're not allowed to mention it or, or try to introduce it. Uh, but the actual ruling that for appeal purposes uh, – would, would be considered the final ruling doesn't happen to trial. So they're gonna have to ask for this to be admitted again if they want to appeal it. And at that point in time, the judge is gonna have to consider the request in light of everything else that's come out at trial. So it can be a very changing environment and depending on what comes out, it's very possible that, that she could revisit that ruling. You just, you don't have time in a pretrial uh, hearing to, to get the entire context of, of the trial uh, and the evidence that she's got that now uh, and it's it's uh, it's going to inform her her ruling on that. So yesterday, I got the slightest impression that that she may be cracking open the door to that because uh, Mr. Baldwin asked for permission pre-clearance basically of certain questions that he wanted to ask. Uh, and he was allowed to ask one of the law enforcement witnesses about uh, whether he believed that the branches, the, the placement of the branches had any uh, like symbolic kind of significance uh, or whether the bodies uh, appeared to him to be posed, whether he believed they had been deliberately posed in the positions uh, in which they had been found. So this is, this is, it's a tiny, tiny little bit of light uh, leading towards that theory, uh, but it is there. She did permit that. So it is possible that the situation may change and that we may ultimately get to hear more about that in the trial setting than we expected. I hope we do, because I think it's, again, like unbelievable that they wouldn't be able to make that argument. It's like, if, if they think it's so outlandish and so stupid and nobody would ever believe it, then what are you worried about? Like, let, let yeah. tell the jury, then the jury will think they're just obviously grasping at straws and then it helps your case. But it seems like there's a little too much there and that's why they don't want it. Number one, number two. Um, so it's basically like in a lot of these cases we've heard, you know, okay, judge, is it out completely? Or do I have to wait till I present evidence before I can argue it? Can I mention it in opening statements? No. So we hear a lot of those types of arguments in different jurisdictions. And that's kind of what it sounds like where they're at in Indiana. And so far the answer has been no, but it could change later, which hopefully we, we get that glimmer of hope. All right. Last yeah, question. I very much, oh, go ahead. I very much hope so. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I think that's huge. And that's, that was something incredibly intriguing to me when I read it. I was like, whoa. And my only experience with Odinism is my Viking shows that I like to watch on Netflix. So that's all I know about Odinism. Um, <laughs> But the uh, the last question I really wanted to get in the courtroom, one of the most important things that we can't even see when trials are streamed that you get the benefit of is what's the vibe of the jury? What type mm -hmm. of jury did they get? Are they paying attention? Do you think they're waiting for the uh, defense's cases? Have they already made up their mind? Or are they just waiting for the defense attorneys to sit down on cross? What's the vibe? Well, uh, this jury uh, has been enormously attentive and engaged. Indiana is a state that does allow juries to ask questions of nice. the witnesses. Uh, so they have asked a lot of questions. They have asked some very good questions. Uh, during the jury selection process, I, I was really impressed with the panel that they had, with the, the pool of, of people that they had to select from. Um, a lot of times what, what you get, it's, it's a, I mean pardon the analogy here, just garbage in, garbage out kind of apply, mm. applies in a lot of settings. But if you don't get a good panel, it's very hard to get a good jury. Uh, mm. The panels that they were getting uh, included a lot of people that understood and very uh, passionately expressed their their support of basic principles of presuming that that a person is innocent that the state has a very significant burden of proof um, that they 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 need to bring the goods um, and uh, and and they they seemed to be very receptive to the uh, these ideas and and willing. Uh, willing to, to, to commit to, to applying them uh, in this process. So I was, I felt very good about the jury that they got um, going into this process, got a strong sense that the jury was, was going to be fair and, and to do their best um, to, to look at things from all sides and, and come up with, with the best decision that they could. I think that their attentiveness here uh, is really, is really bearing that out. I've never been one to try to read the tea leaves about, you know, try to see what the jurors are thinking based on their expressions or or, or things like that. Um, I just, I think, I, I think that can often be a little bit of a fool's errand, 100%. Uh, but certainly you can get a perception of what they're interested in and what they're paying attention to. There are times, for example, when there are hard exchange exchanges going on during, during cross-examination, uh, you can literally, it's like watching a, a tennis match, you know, they're, they're very attentive. 
attentive to the witness, attentive to the lawyer, um, really engaged in this process, have not seen any distinction between the attentiveness they're paying to the prosecutor and the attentiveness that they're paying to the defense. I would say the only time I've seen the jury um, not so interested in what's going on is during the firearms analysis. This testimony went on for a very long time. The analyst was on the stand for the entire day. Uh, her direct examination extended until um, a shortly after the, the lunch break. Um, and so I saw about 90 minutes before we break for lunch. Uh, the, the jury, it was clear that they had heard enough. They're looking up, they're looking out at the audience. They're, they're you know, steepling their fingers. Um, they're just trying to keep themselves uh, engaged in something there in that jury box. So they did not appear extremely interested uh, in, in, a, in a lot of that testimony. Um, in fairness to them, a lot of it was sort of repetitive and, and just not, not really necessary. Um, I didn't see that same type of response nearly as much on the cross exam, but I, I did see a little bit of, of the same thing of just, um, you know, l looking away and, and not necessarily being so focused. So it did in that instance seem like the jury had gotten what they needed from that witness in, in a pretty short period of time. Uh, but for the rest of the time, I haven't seen anything like that. They are very interested in, in what these witnesses have to say and in uh, what the evidence is, is showing. The, and, and that's a great answer to what's the vibe of the jury, because anybody that says like, oh, I can tell this jury's voting this way or voting that way is always tough. But in jury selection, you can you can get a feel for who the people are. Right. If, if you mm -hmm. listen to the questions and hear their answers and then if they're falling asleep or not paying attention, you can get a vibe for that. Or if they really hate an attorney, sometimes that can come off on their face every time that attorney stands up, every time they ask certain questions. The, mm -hmm. the one thing I will say is earlier you said the cell data is going to be a very important part for the defense. And if they're mm -hmm. bored during the ballistics expert, you've got to be careful about boring them during the cell phone tower experts. So the attorneys hopefully paid attention and saw that they were kind of bored during that and try to make a way where at least at the very end, say something like, okay, so we heard all of this. What is your actual opinion in this case as a regards to X? And we actually mm -hmm. get a succinct summary or opinion when it comes to some of those experts that can testify for hours about how we get there in ways that a lot of jurors might not understand. So yeah. really good and analysis. Maybe potentially even get to that right up front yes. and then walk us through the details of how you got there. Uh, you know, to, to the extent they can front load some of that information to just make it more accessible. It, it might be, it might be a wise thing to, to do strategically. I will say some of the questions that we have gotten from this jury, uh, suggest they imply to me potentially technical types of backgrounds. Okay. Uh, I, I just, I have the suspicion that we may have people with experience in, in networks or, um, that, that type of technology just because there have been questions that come through that seem to express um, some felicity with these concepts and with the language. So that will be an interesting detail if, if that is in fact the case um, and ho hopefully would help them uh, be able to make a little bit better sense out of, out of what it is that they're hearing. Which then comes down to the defense's ability to explain what a reasonable doubt is. And if you understand mm -hmm. the tech and all of that stuff and they present their evidence as very much here, or it just proves it wasn't him, or it definitely doesn't prove it was him. Then you explain reasonable doubt. And how do they really get there? And the answer might be a confession, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I yeah. feel like I really appreciate you coming on, giving all that explanation. It was a lot, but I really feel like that's as close as we're going to get to being in the courtroom because with what's coming out, it feels impossible to get information from the case. That's not biased or colored in a certain way or leaving certain things out or regurgitated. It seems like from something that was already said pre-trial, you know, trying to take that mix in some stuff that they've heard about is going on in the trial and then analyze on the way out. So I appreciate that. I appreciate kind of getting a feel for what the state is presenting, how it's being presented, but that it really does seem like the confession is going to be the big step. And the defense is basically saying, just wait. Just wait yep. until we tell you what we've got to tell you. And maybe they have the same belief you do that that door might be creaking open to get that Odinism defense in. And that's why they didn't want to say a lot in opening statement. And that's why they said, just wait. And they really are going to blow the doors off when it comes time for them to present their case to the jury. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining us. You're doing God's work there for weeks um, in Indiana, six days a week sitting there in trial. So if anybody wants to feel like they're inside the trial, go follow Andrea, subscribe, watch her videos, like this video, like her videos. Um, and that's as close as you're going to get to being in the court. And we'll have to do a follow-up at some point because I honestly feel like it's a waste to follow anything else. Cause I don't feel like I get enough of the analysis I'm looking for, because at the end of the day, 
if it's if it's a guilty verdict and you know depending on how the confession stuff comes out i feel like we're understanding what the jury's looking at and how some things outside the jury's control and how it's presented to them i can see how we can get there right um depending mm -hmm. on how the defense's case goes and a lot that's still to happen in this case and that's what i want to look at i don't want to just see it's got to be this it's got to be this it's got to be this because we have to understand a lot of the stuff that happens pre-trial doesn't come in a trial and absolutely affects the way a reasonable juror could look at the case. And it could be very different than the way all of us are looking at it that have seen the whole picture from the beginning, even though we're missing the most important part of the trial. So it seems, is there anything you want to plug or say before we end the episode? No, just that I'm really honored to be here. I've been a fan of your channel for, for quite some time. I really enjoy your analysis, appreciate what you do. Uh, when I get that that question we all get about uh, who who is the person on LawTube that you would least like to see over at opposing counsel table, it's a very easy question for me to answer. Peter Tragos, uh, that guy is formidable. I would not want to have to go head to head with him. So it's been a real honor and, and pleasure to, to be able to be here and have this conversation with you today. Thank you so much. I really hope we can do it again in the future and not just blowing smoke. I would really love to do it, especially in this case, because it's a different vibe when we can talk about it and I can just sit back and listen and feel like I'm getting the information. Like I can do a follow-up video later answering people's questions because of the information you give. So I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, we'll continue to follow you, Andrea, as we go throughout this case. But for this episode, that's all we got. Till next time, we're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.